So hello everyone, you're very welcome to this month's Xling tutorial. And today we are delighted to be hosting Professor Richard Kane from NYU, who is perhaps best known for his work on syntax. And he'll be talking to us today about anti-symmetry and linear order. So before I, I pass this over to Professor Kane, uh, we'll give the, the floor to Professor Bothinas, who is our chair of the Xling Society to introduce uh, a little bit more uh, today's tutorial. Thank you, Kate. Well, today I feel very privileged. We have with us here Richard Kane from New York University. Well, this is one of the strongest names in, in contemporary linguistics uh, and especially syntax. Well, we were talking about syntax the other day with Ian Roberts here, and we continue our discussion. Well, syntax plays a major role in linguistic structuring and language communication. It was the most studied subject in the 70s and 80s, but it still remains. And today, Richard will talk about not only syntax, I don't think we already started our discussion, but syntax in a broader, in a broad sense. I mean, how does syntax function? Why do we have syntax? Uh, what is the relation of syntax with the other components? It's a lot of interesting things. Uh, and especially today, where we have more technologies and more methodologies about brain function, computational linguistics, and we can uh, experiment and check uh, various uh, hypotheses and uh, try to answer basic questions. Well, thank you, Richard, for accepting our invitation. The word is yours, please go ahead. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the uh, title of this uh, tutorial uh, is Anti-Symmetry and Linear Order. Uh, I will try to give you a, a sense of what I mean by anti-symmetry. Uh, the term linear order is a familiar one, uh, I'll just take it for granted. Um, but I thought I should uh, begin with a digression um, uh, on the use of the term uh, theoretical as opposed to the term experimental, uh, because I, I think that those two terms are uh, not always used uh, in the most insightful fashion. Uh, in discussions about linguistics, and in particular about syntax. I think that somebody who uh, is happy to think of himself as a theoretical syntactician, uh, like myself, um, I also think of myself as an experimentalist, uh, not in the sense of uh, laboratory experiments, but in the sense of, in the following sense, uh, when a syntactician works on uh, his or her language, in, in particular native language. Um, what we do, at least an important part of what we do is we take a sentence, let's say we take a sentence that we see is well formed in our language and we experiment on it. We twist it around by changing the word order of part of it or another part of it or by changing the agreement pattern, or by adding negation or subtracting negation. So in effect, we are experimenting on sentences and the results of those experiments, for example, does adding negation have an effect on the well-formedness of this particular sentence? Does it have an effect on the interpretation in any surprising way? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The results of these experiments provide us with a uh, an important set of data 
uh, that we then go on to work with. And of course, syntacticians as a community are doing this uh, with as many languages as possible. Uh, in, a, in a sense, each language that we study gives us a certain kind of window on the language faculty. And if we look at, say, 100 languages, we have 100 different windows on the language faculty, each of which is giving us a slightly different view. And putting all these views together uh, enables us to make uh, substantial progress on understanding uh, the language faculty. Now, uh, in, in this talk, I will be talking about the syntactic part of uh, the language faculty. I won't be uh, doing semantics in any uh, significant way. Uh, I won't be doing phonology in any significant way. Uh, that doesn't mean that semantics and phonology or morphology uh, are irrelevant. It just means that uh, in this particular talk, uh, I'm not addressing uh, those questions, just as I will uh, fail to address innumerable uh, questions. Uh, so let me begin um, with the actual uh, presentation. Uh, as uh, indicated in the first sentence of the, uh, <coughs> of the outline, it seems 99.99999, et cetera, percent clear that there are no pairs of languages such that one is the mirror image of the other. By that, I mean, let's think of English. What would it mean to have mirror image English? It would mean that we have a language with the same words as English, but for every English sentence, there would be a corresponding sentence in mirror image English that would have the property that the words would be pronounced in the reverse order from the order in which they're pronounced in English. It's very easy to think, to, to see what such a language called mirror image English would look like. Uh, I think every linguist who's ever lived would agree that there is no such language and that holds for any uh, language that we pick. Um, in the long run, uh, the question is, uh, why not? Uh, and uh, I will present some ideas which uh, give us uh, a handhold on that uh, question. Now, in studying syntax, we have to keep in mind uh, constantly that, well, syntax has many facets to it. Uh, two prominent ones are word order, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and word order is a property of languages that's pretty, pretty e easy to study. I mean, you take some language, you, you see the word order of sentences in it. It's perhaps not so easy to get the right generalizations, but for any particular sentence, it's easy to see what the word order is. <coughs> The second, uh, a second major component uh, of syntax is the notion of hierarchical structure or constituent structure. Uh, what you think of, uh, if you think of trees, the way trees are used to represent sentences. So if you have a simple sentence like, uh, the cat saw the dog, um, every syntactician I think would agree that it's not simply a sequence of five words. It is a sequence of five words, but it's not only that. Uh, the sentence has substructure. So in the cat saw the dog, the cat forms a subpart of that sentence that's separate from the other, the rest of it. And within what we call the verb phrase, saw the dog, the dog forms a subpart of that verb phrase that's distinct from uh, the verb. And any sentence of any degree of complexity can be broken down into subparts in uh, that way. Now, um, we also have, of course, uh, uh, in addition to the notion of word order, we have a notion of morpheme order. Uh, 
if we think of the classical notion of morphology, um, words can be broken down into a sequence of morphemes with certain complications. Um, I tend to think that um, there's not a sharp distinction between syntax and morphology. Um, but in this talk, I won't be uh, addressing morphology uh, in any uh, direct uh, way. Now, uh, oh, I, I intend to share my screen uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, now, the part of the hypothesis of anti-symmetry says that there cannot be a pair of languages such that one is the mirror image of the other. But the hypothesis actually is much stronger than that. It says that if you take any sentence in any language, and if you look at its word order at the same time as its hierarchical structure, so you think of a tree with the word order given, anti-symmetry says that for any well-formed sentence in any language, the mirror image of that, which reverses the word order without changing the hierarchical structure, that mirror image will be ill-formed if the starting sentence is well-formed. Or putting it another way, no two, no pair of sentences in any language or across languages will ever be perfect mirror images of one another. Um, now, in some of this, uh, I will be using the more technical notions of that, that derive from uh, so-called X-bar theory, uh, the notions specifier, head, and complement. Uh, the idea is that if you have a phrase, uh, the, the most important element which is a single element we call the head. And then the, the phrase that combines directly with the head, we call the complement. And then if another phrase combines with that, we call it the specifier. Uh, convenient terminology. Uh, and the anti the particular formulation of the anti-symmetry hypothesis <laughs> that I proposed in the 90s says, that in every phrase, in every language, the order of the subparts of that phrase is invariably specifier head complement, with no exceptions. Now, if you think of this notion of mirror image, uh, you can immediately think of apparent counterexamples. So people will think of, for example, the fact that although in English, uh, the normal word order is verb object, that, went, that is just looking at those two pieces of a sentence. Uh, we all know that in Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, Turkish, and many other languages, the normal order is object verb. And there's a certain sense in which object verb and verb object are in a mirror image relation. But that's not directly relevant to the anti-symmetry hypothesis that I'm discussing here, which requires that we take into account hierarchical structure at the same time as word order. So the Japanese English question is properly construed as follows. If we look at a piece of an English sentence that has verb object and a piece of the corresponding Japanese sentence that has object verb, are they in a mirror image relation once we take into account hierarchical structure? And the answer that I would like to give is no. Uh, but to, and in, in, in this tutorial, I'll try to give you some sense of how one can use empirical data uh, to get at this uh, anti-symmetry uh, question. 
Uh, for those of you who know the work of Joseph Greenberg, uh, who published a, uh, an extremely well-known paper on universals of word order uh, in the 60s, uh, one way to think about anti-symmetry is that it takes a fairly large set of Greenbergian universals and claims to be able to explain them all as the result of a single hypothesis, namely uh, anti-symmetry. Um, now, let's jump. Uh, now I should share my screen if I succeed in doing this. <clears throat> I think I've succeeded. Um, if I haven't, please tell me. Uh, what, what you're seeing on the screen is um, the proofs of an article of mine that's going to appear uh, fairly soon uh, in a journal uh, called uh, Studies in Chinese Linguistics. Um, if you ask why that journal, uh, the answer is not of great interest. Um, Chinese is obviously a language that's extremely interesting for the question of anti-symmetry, for those of you who know things about Chinese. Um, so let's uh, jump. This uh, article is uh, too big uh, to be presented in one uh, session like this. Uh, so I will try to concentrate on the sort of middle part of it. Of, of it. Um, noting that one of the major um, ways of thinking about anti-symmetry involves the study of cross-linguistic gaps. Now, in this sense, uh, the study of anti-symmetry is very Greenbergian because Greenberg himself, uh, one of the really notable aspects of his work was that he was able to see certain word order patterns that are in fact never found. Now, of course, if you look at lots of languages, there's lots of word order variation. Greenberg, Greenberg's article from the 60s had the great merit of calling attention to the fact that certain perfectly um, imaginable word order combinations of properties are in fact not ever found. And anti-symmetry tries to do something similar in a much more uh, detailed, uh, precise, uh, fine-grained uh, way, but in a way that's in, in spirit uh, fairly uh, similar. And of course, anti-symmetry has a, a theoretical status that, that Greenberg's uh, paper uh, didn't have. Um, Let's note in passing that the study of gaps, which is essentially the study of what's not there, uh, corresponds to uh, something that came to the fore at the very beginning of generative syntax going back to the 1950s, which is that very often interesting things in a particular language, if not often the most interesting things, are precisely what's not possible. And, and a, a great deal of what syntacticians do is look within a given language for what's impossible in that language, especially impossible in a somewhat surprising way, given the rest of the language. Uh, this is something that it didn't uh, originate with generative syntax. In fact, there's a, a notable French linguist who wrote a grammar in the 1920s, at, at, which showed that he was a theoretical syntactician before his time. I mean, he would look at certain aspects of French syntax and immediately see what was not possible alongside what was possible. 
Now, uh, so against that background, uh, let's start with the uh, initial uh, topic here, actually uh, having to do with the word topic. Um, uh, thinking of a, uh, a paper by uh, the Italian linguist Guglielmo Cinque from 1977, who showed that if you study what we can, might informally call topicalization in Italian, you can show very straightforwardly uh, that their Italian has at least two very distinct types uh, of topicalization, one of which he called uh, uh, hanging topics, uh, and the other of which he called <coughs> clinic left dislocation, uh, abbreviated as CLLD uh, in, the, um, in this article. Uh, What's notable is that, um, well, there are two things that are, at least two things that are notable. One is that if you look at the Italian hanging topics, it seems virtually certain that no language, uh, I, I left out a, uh, a crucial piece, uh, the hanging topics that Cinque studied occur at the beginning of an Italian sentence, at the left-hand edge of an Italian sentence. It seems virtually certain that no language has an exact equivalent of Italian hanging topics at the end of the sentence. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, if you study the properties of clitic left dislocation as you see them in various languages, and you compare them to the properties of clitic right dislocation. So let me just give English examples. Uh, although English is not the best language to study this in, um, clitic left dislocation would be uh, something like <clears throat> that guy, I like him a lot. And clitic right dislocation would be. I like him a lot, that guy. Uh, Romance languages use these much more than English does, and, and therefore it's it easy to, to study in Romance languages. Um, if we lived in a symmetric linguistic universe, that is a linguistic universe that was not anti-symmetric in the sense that I'm discussing, we might just expect that clitic left dislocation and clitic right dislocation would actually have identical properties, except for the single fact that in one case, the dislocated element is at the beginning of the sentence and in the other case, at the end. But in fact, as was shown by um, an Italian linguist, Cecchetto, uh, and by a, a Catalan linguist, uh, Bilalba, um, Clitic left dislocation and clitic right dislocation are not identical in their properties uh, at all. Uh, this is something that's not at all surprising from an anti-symmetric perspective that says that syntax in human language is not at all symmetric despite certain apparent uh, indications that it might be. Um, we can also note that um, although lots of languages have clitic left dislocation, uh, at least if we look at SVO languages, there seem to be uh, SVO languages that lack, um, well, let me, uh, sorry here. <clears throat> Uh, there are SVO languages, such as Haitian Creole and Bumbe, which is a West African language, that seem to lack clitic right the uh, dislocation entirely. But apparently, no SVO language that lacks left dislocation entirely. Now, section five. Um, certainly one of the most surprising discoveries um, 
in syntax in the last 50 years on the empirical side of things is the discovery that started with work by Downing in a 78 paper and Keenan in an 85 paper on relative clauses. If we look at lots of languages, we discover very quickly that there are post-nominal relative clauses uh, of the English type. We have the book that, uh, the, say, the, the person that John was talking to, where the relative clause proper that John was talking to uh, follows what we informally call the head of the relative, namely person in that kind of example. But there are also lots of languages in which relative clauses typically or sometimes invariably precede the head noun. So there are languages where instead of the person that I saw, you would get something like the that I saw person, or perhaps that I saw the person, uh, or perhaps that I saw person without any definite article. So the field knows very well that the language faculty allows both post-nominal and pre-nominal relatives. But Downing and Keenan uh, discovered something rather uh, surprising, uh, namely that the pre-nominal relatives and the post-nominal relatives don't have the same properties. Uh, as you can see in seven uh, in the article, uh, pre-nominal relatives generally lack complementizers of the that sort, whereas uh, that's not true for post-nominal relatives. It's not that every language with post-nominal relatives has something like English that. Um, many do and many don't. It's that pre-nominal relatives seem to systematically lack something like English that. Quite in a, in a very similar way as in eight, uh, what we call relative pronouns of the who or the which type are sometimes found in postnominal relatives, but apparently never in prenominal relatives. And finally, uh, in number nine, um, prenominal relatives tend strongly to be non finite that is to be infinitival or gerundial um, or participial, uh, whereas post-nominal relatives uh, are much more readily uh, finite, that is indicative or subjunctive. So this is again relative clauses here <coughs> are another example in which we see that the language faculty is not at all symmetric in a way that we might have expected it to be if we hadn't thought of anti-symmetry. Um, now there's a particularly interesting piece of evidence in favor of this, which is not easy to get across quickly. I'll, I'll make an effort. And if you're interested in the details, you can go to uh, this paper by uh, Jacqueline Kornfeld on uh, Turkish, on two Turkish languages. Uh, these languages um, have prenominal relatives. And uh, they, in, in addition, have agreement on the noun of a phrase that has a prenominal relative. So if you have something like uh, the um, Mary saw person, interpreted as the person that Mary saw, the noun person will be followed by an agreement morpheme that's agreeing in features with the subject of the pre-nominal relative clause in the example I gave, uh, Mary. Now, Kornfeld proposes a, a, a nice analysis of this. Uh, the interesting fact for anti-symmetry is given in 10. As far as we know, it's true. Um, no post-nominal relatives ever have their subject determining agreement 
such that the agreement morphine precedes the head noun. In other words, if you take the kind of relative clause plus agreement configuration that Kornfield studied for those two Turkish languages, it seems that uh, we don't find the mirror image of that uh, anywhere. Now, of course, you might be thinking, how do we know that 10 is true? Or how do we know that some of the other things I've said are true? And the answer, as always in science, is that we don't know with certainty that 10 is true. And we don't know with certainty, with absolute certainty, that anything is true. But the way to understand 10 is that it's a statement that has the property that as far as we know from the languages that we know about, 10 is true. It's, of course, important to test 10 <laughs> against more and more and more languages. And as we do that, we will see uh, whether 10 continues to be true, the more languages that 10 is compatible with it, the greater our confidence that 10 is systematically true. If on the other hand, we come up with a language that's a counterexample to 10, well, then we proceed in a normal fashion, which is not a simple fashion. We then ask whether this apparent counterexample is what we might call a, a superficial counterexample, meaning that we could tweak the formulation of 10 in such a way that the counterexample disappears. Alternatively, it might be the case that the counterexample is what we might call a deep counterexample that really cannot be accommodated at all. And this is just the normal part of doing uh, linguistics. Um, let's just note uh, in section uh, six here, uh, coordination. Um, as in 11a, uh, having you know, x and y uh, as a coordinate phrase is perfectly ordinary. Um, some languages have the equivalent of and x and y as, as a possible uh, coordination, for example, French. Some languages have uh, x and y and as a possible coordination. Uh, but there's a nice paper by Zwart uh, from 2009 that notes that <coughs> if we stick to coordination phrases in which there's a, there's a single instance of and, we find the facts in 11, namely that and in, in those simpler cases is invariably between X and Y. And this is something that fits in directly to the idea that all phrases are of the form of specifier head complement. Um, but I won't uh, pursue that uh, because uh, let me actually jump to uh, eight, uh, which is one of the most uh, fascinating aspects uh, of anti-symmetry, I think, although it's at the same time, one of the most difficult to study. Um, as you probably know, if you've read about or, or, or done uh, syntax, certain aspects of syntax are much easier to study than others. Um, and what I will now get to uh, in eight, in section eight here, uh, seems to fall into the more difficult ones, which doesn't mean that we don't have to study it. It just means that it takes more effort, more time. Um, the background is the fact that English has the property that both 16 and 17 are well-formed. Uh, the fact that John is here means that he's well again, and the fact that he's here means that John is well again are both possible. Now, these two senses have the property that in structure, in, in hierarchical terms, the antecedent John does not 
is not higher in the tree in the technical sense, or more technically put, John in 16 and 17 does not see command uh, the pronoun he that takes John as its antecedent. Conversely, he does not uh, see command John. Uh, so uh, now we know from much work on pronouns that the notion of see command, the notion of being higher in the tree than something else plays an important role. <clears throat> 16 and 17 give the impression that when uh, neither John nor he C commands the other, anything goes. Uh, and this impression fed into a, a prominent paper by Lasnik back in 76, um, which I won't go into the details of. Uh, what's important is that Lasnik took it for granted back then uh, that uh, English was representative. And now let's keep in mind that uh, linguistics, like other sciences, has the property that you have to start somewhere and that at any stage in the development of your field, you only have a finite amount of data uh, to work with. Uh, in linguistics, one aspect of this is that at any given time in the development of linguistics, we have only a finite number of languages that we can work with. Um, as the field develops, and as you can see very easily if you look at the history of the field uh, over the last five, six, seven, et cetera, decades, the number of languages feeding into linguistics has grown considerably, much more than in the 70s. So when Lasnik was writing his paper, he couldn't, he wasn't able to draw on anywhere near as many languages as we're able to draw on uh, now. And now we know that English with respect to 16 and 17 is not representative. Uh, in the next paragraph here, I note uh, several languages, uh, Haitian Creole, Chinese, uh, Hakaltek, which is a Mayan language, Danish, uh, which is of course relatively close to English, and also Malayalam. Uh, these languages all allow sentences like 17 less than English does, and sometimes much less. And sometimes it's claimed that uh, a language like Hakaltek uh, or Jayashila or, or Malayalam for some speakers never allows sentences like 17 in which the pronoun precedes um, its own antecedent. What's important here is that nobody has ever said that the, that the same is true of 16. Nobody has ever said that there are languages in which 16 is not good. Now this may be a bit oversimplified. The main point is that 17 seems very clearly to be much less widespread than 16. And again, if our linguistic universe were truly symmetric, uh, this would be a uh, surprise. Um, now, uh, let me <coughs> um, say a few words about section nine, which actually I, is, is not, well, uh, section nine yeah, is here. Um, uh, for those of you who, who are, are following uh, Chomsky's recent work, re recent meaning, let's say, uh, the last 20 years or so, um, Chomsky has taken the position, which is related to positions he had taken earlier, but much more explicit now, that <laughs> linear order is not part of what he calls core syntax. Uh, 
So he sees the language faculty as having a core syntax component, and then uh, as having other components, one of which is to post core syntax, which is more linked, closely linked to phonology than core syntax is. Um, <coughs> The question whether Chomsky is correct about that is not something that I can do just justice to in this uh, short amount of time. Uh, as you can probably see from the way I'm presenting it, I'm not uh, really in agreement. Uh, I tend to think that there's syntax and that's it. There's no core, non-core uh, distinction. But what's relevant to anti-symmetry here, and which I discuss in section nine of this paper, is the question, what is the relevance of anti-symmetry to Chomsky's notion of externalization, by which Chomsky, well, for our purposes, that it's just the notion that linear order is not part of core syntax. Uh, and I suggest in, in section nine that if we ask a really challenging question, uh, which I didn't ask myself when I introduced anti-symmetry back in the 90s, and that is the question, why should anti-symmetry hold? Why should the language faculty be anti-symmetric in the way that it is, if, if I'm right. Um, and by that, I don't mean what is, what is the empirical, what are the empirical arguments in favor of anti-symmetry? I'm saying now, let's assume that there are sufficient empirical arguments in favor of anti-symmetry to convince us that it's a correct hypothesis. We can then go up a notch in abstraction and ask why anti-symmetry should, should be a property of the language faculty in the first place. And in section nine, but in a way I, I, I won't have time to go into, I suggest that um, anti-symmetry is a property of the language faculty because linear order itself is much more of a core property of the language faculty than Chomsky thinks. And that it's in fact impossible to separate, to extract, to um, factor out linear order from core syntax. Uh, a way to think of this a uh, slightly different way of thinking about it, uh, and this is, uh, I will end on, on this note. Um, the term linear order is a convenient term that uh, I've, everybody uses, and uh, I'm not an exception. Um, but there's a sense in which the term is misleading. Because we know if we think about it, that when we talk about linear order, uh, we're really talking about temporal order. We're talking, uh, when we say that, let's say in an, a language of the English type, uh, subject, verb, object is the linear order that we get in normal cases. To say that the linear order is subject, verb, object is to say that in the normal case, in English, the subject is pronounced first, and then the verb, and then the object. Similarly, if we say that in a simple phrase like the dog in English, the definite article linearly precedes the noun, well, that's true in the sense in which we use the term. But it's important, I think, to recognize that what we're really saying is that in the pronunciation of any phrase like the dog in English, the definite article must be pronounced first, temporally first. 
<clears throat> before dog. And of course, we know that that's not true of all languages. There are languages in which uh, the definite article is pronounced after uh, the noun. <clears throat> this is, I think, important because that is, you might think, well, what does it matter uh, if we emphasize temporal as opposed to linear? Uh, I think it matters because Chomsky's externalization idea really amounts to saying that the notion temporal order is not part of core syntax, which amounts to saying that the notion time, the notion time slots or sequence of time slots is not part of core syntax. Um, as you can see, I think that he's wrong, but I think that bringing in the notion temporal order in a very explicit way makes the question more acute. Um, and on that note, I will stop and welcome uh, questions of any sort. Thanks very much, Professor Kane. So that was really interesting, um, brilliant talk. So if there are any questions, again, please just um, raise your hand on the reactions uh, tab. Thanks very much. So, um, Antonis, you have a question, go ahead. Thank you, Richard. Well, I have many questions and comments. I don't know where to start, but I shall start from the last one. You said about the article, the definite, which is usually before the noun. You may, I don't know, you may know that in Swedish, uh, the indefinite article goes before the noun and the definite after. Yes, I, I didn't say that English was typical. I said specifically that there are languages. Yeah, yeah yes, I, I, support, I support your argument. Ah. Just, just, just to provide you an example, please write it down. For instance, uh, I mean, uh, common words like book in Swedish, you have um, end book, which means a book, and then the definite article is booken, the book. It goes after. And if we if we connect this with morphology and syntax and where the boundary the boundaries are, the strange thing in Swedish is that n book. You have a space between the article and the noun. But when you say booken, you don't have any space. That's, that's how they write. I mean, to say, even we in European languages, why do we have some pronouns separated from the noun, et cetera, or the articles or whatever? It's tradition. The Greeks did that and we all follow it. No, I think there's more to it than that. Uh, I think the... Uh, I suspect that the Swedish orthographic fact is like the fact that in Romance languages um, of the Spanish and Italian sort, their pronominal clitics, when they precede the verb, are separated from it by a space. But when they follow the verb, they are not separated from it by a space. Precisely. And I think that that a difference in orthography is correlated with a difference in syntax, which has been brought out very clearly in a paper by Paula Beninca and Guglielmo Cinque um, 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, they noted that you can coordinate pronominal clitics in Italian under very special circumstances. But what's interesting for this discussion is that you can only do that when the clitics are pre-verbal. You cannot do it even under the same conditions if they're post-verbal. Uh, 
that suggests that there's really a syntactic asymmetry between pre-noun, pre-verbal clitics and post-verbal ones, which I think is related to a much broader difference between prefixes and suffixes. That the traditional terminology, which takes prefix and suffix, the each be a subtype of affix, gives the impression that prefixes and suffixes are symmetrical to each other. Just the difference in order relative to the root. But I think there's good reason to think that that's not the case. Uh, again, you can see that with coordination. In English, in certain cases, you can coordinate prefixes, pre and post revolutionary France. As far as I know, you can never do that with suffixes. So I think the, the people who created the orthography in uh, languages of the Swedish type or languages of the Romance type were actually expressing an intuition, a correct intuition that they had, that pre and post are not symmetric to each other. Yes, but still it is a lot of traditions and uh, at a particular time, which opinions were stronger? Uh, because if we take complex morphological words in different languages, some languages have one word, some others they have two or three. And the same language, it could be the opposite. I mean, it's it's tradition. It's uh, yeah, so I, I the think boundaries that... between syntax and morphology are not as clear cut as a lot of people think. Well, I don't think they're clear cut at all. But I think that in, in all these interesting cases that you mentioned of orthographic discrepancies, um, we as linguists need to ask whether those orthographic discrepancies reflect some real property of the languages in question, or whether on the, on the contrary, they're just ac accidents of history. And I, I don't think that yes, it's so easy to know what the correct answer is without looking into it carefully. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Kate, do we have some other questions yeah. or may I put one more? We have a, um, a question from Leticia. So if you don't mind, we'll, we'll okay, take that okay, 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 okay. and we'll come back to you. Okay, okay. Leticia, go ahead. Oh, hello. Thank you very much for hello. your conference. And my question is that if do you think that the relevance of linear ordering, temporal ordering, is due to the constraints uh, of the processing apparatus on the way language functions? <clears throat> Um, if I had to give a quick answer, I would say no. Uh, no. But a, a more careful answer would be that uh, there's a bit of a chicken and egg question there. Um, I tend to think that processing, the, the properties of processing reflect facts about linear order. Uh, I tend not to think that linear order reflects properties of processing, but um, I'm happy to think that that's an open question that, that we can continue to look into in the future. And because we, since we process from left to right and we keep things on memory, particularly activate, it seems that uh, there is some asymmetry between what comes first, what comes next. Ab absolutely. I, I agree completely. In fact, the, the notion of left to right processing actually plays a role in some of my formulations of anti-symmetry. So I agree completely that um, processing, in addition to comprehension, it, I mean, that is processing it both in the, uh, that is, uh, I agree that both the question of production 
and the question of processing what we hear, uh, both of those are relevant to syntax in the broad sense of linguistics. It's, I don't think it's easy to, to bring these different aspects of linguistics together, but it's certainly something that needs to be done in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Tizia. Um, so, Antonis, I think you had one more question. Well, I, I have just a comment, and uh, I will just refer to a story long, long time ago when I was a student in Sweden. Well, we are in the kitchen of the university drinking coffee, and I was telling my supervisor about the experiment I was going to carry out and said, why don't you have a listening experiment first to see about the distinctions? Because I was taking for granted that we had distinctions. And the case was in Greek about proclitic and enclitic structures which are related to stress distribution. I was investigating stress and it was the enclitic and proclitic structure. Okay, I took ex an experiment, I changed the order and I listened myself. I couldn't understand the difference. So in certain cases, proclitic and clitic structure you can't perceive the difference. Although at that time, I was saying, yes, of course. What I mean to say is that, okay, let me say something else. The phoneticians are well aware of. If people perceive correctly, so to say, more than two thirds, something like 65%, we say they understand the distinction. We hardly understand, perceive 100%. It's very rare. How we communicate, we guess all the time. If I go back to linguistics, to theoretical linguistics, one person is sitting in his or her desk, writes a sentence, and says, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. It's very easy, ask 10 students. And then you have your experiment. Okay, this sentence is correct or not correct in accordance to the response of the students. I mean to say in this case, theoretical linguistics would win a lot because I repeat, a lot of times we just make mistakes. We think we have distinction or functions. Well, I, I, I certainly agree that uh, linguists are subject to making mistakes. Uh, one thing that's interesting about syntax in particular, uh, when, when work is done on languages for which there are many native speakers working on that language, you get very quick, um, that is the, the accuracy of your claim is subject to controls very quickly. Uh, I mean, if, if I make a claim about English, I say this sentence is well formed and that sentence is not, and I send out my paper to 100 syntacticians, or say to 500 syntacticians, of which say 100 are English speakers, if I've made a mistake, I will find out. Of course, I can try to be careful. But one thing that one has to pay very careful attention to is the fact that there's really no such thing as English, as we know. That is, you know, 
uh, let me take, let me give a, a, an extreme formulation, which I have given in print uh, uh, in, in the past. Um, I think it's virtually certain that no two people have the same grammar. In particular, no two English speakers have the same grammar. Everybody knows that there's some syntactic variation within the English speaking world. I think typically that's a vast underestimate. There's much more than we think there is. And we as linguists have to pay extremely careful attention to that. Then so, you should talk about syntactic plasticity. No, it's not plasticity. I mean, my <laughs> syntax is what it is, and my wife's English syntax is what it is. And though, even though we're both from New York City, my English and her English are different in some respects. It's not plasticity. I mean, my English is rigid, and so is hers, and they happen to disagree in certain very particular ways. And that's, I mean, I don't mean to say that there aren't any cases of murky data. Uh, that's a different kind of question. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. We have enjoyed our discussion with you. Well, thank you all very much for listening. And it was excellent. And we hope to see you sometime in person in the near future. Ah, uh, yes. In person seeing would be a very nice thing after. Thank <laughs> you. Back really to you, happy. Kate. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we, we don't have any more questions. I'll just give one last chance for uh, any comments or questions from anyone. Okay, I think I think that's it for today. So before we, we let you go and enjoy your weekends, I just wanted to announce our next tutorial, which will be on June the 24th with Professor Judith Kroll from the University of California, Irvine. Um, and also to uh, remind you of our conference in Paris on the 17th to the 19th of October. Uh, and alongside our conference, we'll be having our first ever language technology exhibition. So please do check out our newly updated website where we are currently accepting abstracts and applications for that. So once again, thank you very much, Professor Kane. It was an honor to have you with us today. Thank you um, again. And thank you all for joining us. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good thank weekend. You. Bye. Bye now.